Reed. Good morning, church. How are you? Great. You had a good week after Easter? Short week. Anyone maximize the, the holidays? Take a few days off, get more? Yeah? No, you wouldn't do that, would you? You'd be in at work, putting the extra effort in, ready for the weekend, yeah? Sure. Let's go with that. Look, it's great to have you here. If you joined us last week at Easter, it was a fantastic weekend, wasn't it? And if that was your first time, you've come back. It's an honor to have you here as well. Hope you continue to enjoy that you meet some great people here because I think that we're a pretty good church, yeah? Phil, we've got some good people uh, all on the same, kind of going in the same direction with what God wants for us in our life and how we can keep growing in that. Uh, today, though, we're starting this series that we planned a long time ago uh, because it's obviously a big need uh, in not just the church, but in the world, and COVID kind of amplified the need for it. Now, it wasn't that we were successful in this area before COVID, but it really illuminated the need to speak into it, which the Bible does a fair bit, and it's this whole area of the things that are going on in our mind, our thoughts, our fears, the anxiety we feel, uh, that depression that sometimes people go through quite severely or even mildly that, that many of us have probably experienced, in, particularly in the last couple of years, of just being worn down even, of the thoughts that we're dealing with, the state of our mind, uh, can have a huge impact in our life, in who we are becoming, in how we are experiencing, and even how we are viewing things like God and other people and ourselves. And the Bible isn't silent on this topic, it is actually quite vocal on these topics, uh, and this is why we've got uh, Nikki coming next week to speak a little bit more uh, accurately and specifically into some, some of the, maybe the more difficult to communicate aspects from a very professional aspect, uh, point of view, I mean. Uh, Nikki actually worked with, if you remember last year, we had Dr. Uh, Dr. Robbie Zonderega here for a weekend, and uh, Nikki trained and worked with him for a number of years when she was on the sunny coast, and so she was the, the one that actually put us into contact with him, and now that she's able to come, uh, we're going to hear from her, so I'd make sh I would make sure if I were you to be here next Sunday, and she's bringing a different message at night as well, so if you're wanting to learn and grow in this area, next Sunday in the morning and night would be a great way of putting more tools in your tool belt uh, in this area in particular. But we're going to have a look through at a few things through the Bible in the next month that address these topics and how we can move ourselves, if we find ourselves in a cave, how we can step out of these caves. And also identifying some of the things that we do that gradually step ourselves into it. And where this comes from is a story in the Old Testament where one of the big hitters, one of the, the well-known prophets, finds himself fleeing in fear and uh, anxiety, kind of in a panic, flees and hides in a cave, and he has this great interaction with God while he's hiding away in a cave. But what, is, what happens here, let me set the scene here, is his name's Elijah. He, as I said, he's known as one of the, if not the greatest of the prophets in the Old Testament. He's just coming from this amazing victory that he had over 850 prophets. It was like 1v850, uh, prophets of Baal and Asherah. Um, and what essentially there was is, is he rocks up to these people who are defiling the temples all against our God, and uh, he says, hang on, you are serving the wrong one. I'm going to show you that there is only one true, powerful God. Uh, let's do a competition. And this is why I like Elijah, because his first thought is like, how can we turn this into a competition? Uh, and so what they do is they set up two altars and say, whoever's God comes and consumes in fire, our sacrifices, that is evidence of the one true God. And so they, he lets them go first. Uh, and again, one of, why it's one of my favorite stories is while they're all dancing around, screaming to the sky, Elijah starts taunting them. <laughs> he, he, trash talk is biblical, guys. If it's in a competition setting, right? No, okay, be nice. But he starts trash talking them uh, and even kind of like taunting whoever they're praying for it, it, to the point, get this, I love that this is in the Bible. He starts going, maybe you should yell louder, perhaps your gods are sleeping and you need to wake them up. Maybe they've gone away on a holiday, and this is in the Bible, guys, this is, perhaps your gods are relieving themselves. Like, maybe they're caught on the toilet and they forgot to come. Like, how good is this? <laughs> Just they're writing down taunts for opposition soccer teams when at kids' games on Saturday. No. <laughs> 
But he starts taunting them. Anyway, it gets to his turn. He goes, let's up the ante. Let's dig a moat around it. Let's cover it in heaps and heaps and heaps of water. Uh, let's make this hard. And then he prays to God. Uh, it comes down, uh, God comes in fire, consumes the whole sacrifice and licks up all the water as well. Now, that didn't bode well for the other prophets because what happened is Elijah, Elijah got to kill all of them, uh, which when you think about 850, that's a lot of poking. It would have been a long day's work anyway, not the greatest part, but, but pretty significant. But then he goes from that story into another story where Elijah starts praying for the drought, which was a devastating drought for a number of years, uh, to break. That's the story we know where he sends his servant out seven times to check the sky for a cloud and he sees a, comes back saying there's a cloud the size of a man's fist and Elijah goes, that's all we need, let's roll. And says, we gotta go tell everyone the rains are coming uh, and starts running. Um, and all of a sudden the storm builds up. And I love this little detail in here. I think and this is kind of a supernatural story as well. They, they throw in there that Elijah outruns the chariot. Again, the boy's competitive. <laughs> I <laughs> love me some Elijah stories. Anyway, outruns a chariot, not bad kind of fitness regime he's on or empowered by God, but off he goes. And then we find ourselves in this interaction where it's the king that kind of Elijah has shown up a number of times now, um, goes home and starts to tell the stories of what Elijah has been doing. And these are epic stories, aren't they? These are huge victories. And Elijah should be running on high right now. But what I've learned in my life and I've learned by looking through scripture, is that often the greatest attack comes straight after a great spiritual victory. And this is what we see with Elijah here as well, when you think if any time in his life he can stand there, puff his chest out and go, I can take on the world, all of a sudden we see he gets shaking in his boots and heads for the hills. And this is King Ahab as he's telling Jezebel the story. It says in 1 Kings 19, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Uh, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like, the ones, uh, like that of one of them. Essentially, by this time tomorrow I want you dead. So Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Notice that this was not an attempt on his life, this was a text message, a nasty comment on his feed. This was, was a criticism, was a threat, this was just a, a verbal kind of message from someone saying, I don't like you, but I do wanna kill you. Just after he had dealt with 850 people who were in a competition to see who was gonna live and die, he was, literally facing life and death in the previous story and fine with it. But now he gets this one threat and uh, Elijah starts to freak out a little bit. And this is what I've noticed is even if the situation kind of doesn't deem it, it's not always how we feel, is it? Often our feelings take control and even if you go, well, that doesn't seem right. To f Why would you feel that way? We all know that our feelings don't often listen to our logic. And all of a sudden, Elijah here is feeling pressure, even though we're kind of going, why? Well, let's be honest, a lot of the time that we feel under pressure and start panicking, we could probably ask ourselves the same questions, going, we've dealt with so much more than this, why am I feeling this way now? Well, Elijah starts feeling that way anyway. The pressure and feelings don't often relate to reality. Anyway, he continues, he says, when he came to Bathsheba, which which is a pretty cool story uh, in Bathsheba because that is where Elijah made that commitment to follow God, where he'd be all in, I'm going to be a prophet. He went back to the place, when he fleed uh, out of fear, he went back to the place where he encountered God. Anyway, there's a whole cool story in there. Um, this was in Judah. But there is where he left his servant and he started to walk away from the place that he encountered God. Anyway, so he left his servant there, he's by himself, and while by himself, he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, which is a low one, sat under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. There's a prayer that I think over the last couple of years, there's not many people who haven't prayed, yeah? You know, you open up the, the news app, and you're like, first headline, oh, I've had enough. 
what do I have to wear now? Where do I have to go now? What do I have to check now? Well, who do I have to talk to now? What is going on? What is the update? I don't even know that person. That link's not working. Oh, can I go to work? Can I not? Am I allowed to hug my children or have I got to stay away from them? Like, maybe that's a good thing or depending on how the day's going, you know? Like, sorry, kids, you have to quarantine. But we just... There's times where I think all of us have said this are going, I have just had enough. I, am, I don't know how to deal with what is coming at me and it might be COVID related, it might not be, it might be, I don't know where the money is coming from. I've had enough of having the same thought over and over again of dealing with the same pressures or just building pressure. I don't, I don't know if I can handle this. I've had enough. So Elijah goes to the next step. It says, God, just take my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. Now after this, he has a couple of really cool encounters with, with an angel, a messenger of God comes and, hey, keep eating something, don't give up, keep eating, let's keep going, let's keep going on this journey. And Elijah finds himself, as I said, he withdraws into this cave uh, where God starts speaking to him, he says, come on, come, I wanna show you something, come to the edge of the mountain and this is where we know the story, we're gonna go into it more this, this month where God reveals uh, big rushing wind and earthquakes and fire, but it says that God wasn't in those things. But then a still small voice while Elijah was in the cave saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now we can emphasize that in plenty of different ways. Really, we don't know which way God emphasized it about what are you doing in here? We don't know whether it was a calling him out of going, Elijah, what are you, what are you doing here? That's how I would probably say it, but thankfully, I found that I'm not God. What are you doing? We don't know how God emphasized, but we do know the questions. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? This little small voice. And I think that a cave is a good description of probably people feeling this way. I know I've found myself in plenty of caves over the time where God's come across in different ways, gently saying, Doug, what are you what are you doing in here, mate? There's been a plenty of times where I chucked a tantrum and walked into a cave and that's when I feel God slap me around and go, what are you doing in here? Come on, are we going here again? <laughs> but it's such a good description of how we find ourselves in a lot of places where it's dark and dingy, it feels kind of gloomy, it's disorientating, not, maybe we don't know how to get out and we're pretty confident that there are bats in here, yeah? Like, when we have these feelings, we're going, I don't know, there are monsters wherever I'm at, though. I'm confident of that. There's something gross here, and uh, maybe this is our Batman origin story, but likely it's just a place of fear and anxiety. And here's what I want to look at. I know that we haven't been doing well at this before COVID, but let me just show why this is, I think, a particularly good thing for us to address as people and as the church. Uh, now, whether you go, well, this doesn't relate to me, that's fine, but if you just had a look around for a second, someone near you, definitely this does relate to. And we need to be equipped and understand uh, that this is a real thing. People struggle with our mindsets, uh, with depression, anxiety, with fear, with all sorts of things, and we need to, I think the church should be well equipped, because God is good at equipping us in these areas. But let's have a look in the last few years, uh, between March 2020 and September 21, 21 million people in Australia access mental health related services. 21 million, maybe not individuals, but 21 million uh, services were given. That is a lot. In 2021, there was a 21% increase on before COVID of mental health related prescriptions given, which was already up significantly from the previous measurement period. In the four weeks leading up to 19th of September, which was a window that, that the government continually used as a measuring tool, those four-week period, Lifeline saw historical daily high volumes. 96,273 calls were offered, which is 33% up on before COVID. Just in four weeks, Kids Helpline received th just under 33,000 contact attempts and they were able to answer just under half of them. This is 16% up from the same period before COVID. Beyond Blue received 27,000 contacts, which was up 20% from the same period in those four weeks period. This is something that I, I, 
I want us to be equipped on, not hide away from and not just close our eyes and faith our way through it. Yes, we need faith, but also can we, can we actually ad- address that this is something that the world is suffering with, that the church is dealing with as well. There's, this is not a us and them thing, this is a people thing, and that we need to deal with this well. So let me just say straight up front is that, that there is often a big biological thing going on in people's lives. That's a very genuine thing that people deal with. In the same breath, not, not every time is the problem biological or is the answer biological, but it is often a thing that people have to deal with. So we don't want to be, have this culture of just, well, just toughen up, quiet down, just deal through it. No, often this is a problem. The other one is I think in the church we need to be, get better at removing the stigma that is still touching it. Now, we're doing a lot better job, but, but I think there is still some, some way to go. Is that some of you, wear glasses and no, no one here is critical that you wear glasses. No one's saying that you lack faith. I put them on when I'm using my computer and every time I'm doing it, I'm not hearing that you have little faith. No one is thinking that your workspace because you're wearing them uh, or that you're trying to earn or, or trying to you know, undercut God's miracles. It's just that there's a part of your body that isn't working at optimal uh, f- functionality. And the truth is, our mind is still a part of the body and there's often times that it doesn't run at optimal capacity as well. See, I have little injuries every now and then. I deal with them through stretching, uh, by training, by doing certain workouts, by ibuprofen every now and then, uh, and by complaining a lot is my main way of dealing with my injuries. <laughs> if you're at my house, you understand that is, that is the healing process, right? But uh, often neurofin and deep heat and all sorts of things come into play and stretching and, and things like that. Uh, and often I've found in my life and in a number of people's lives that, that we need to understand that our mind can often function in the same way. Just as I've hurt myself or I'm not functioning at optimal capacity in another way, my mind is a part of my body and it can sometimes struggle to run at optimum capacity and I need to make sure that I'm doing the right things to get back to being healthy. And so as a church, let's, let's not push aside one thing and accept all the other things that we might deal with. Of going, oh, you hurt yourself in a game of football, fair enough. Well, can I tell you that over the last little season, a lot of the world has hurt themselves going through this. Of the fear, the pressure, the anxiety, there has been some pain. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we want to continue to move forward. The church should be really good at addressing these kinds of things. And as people, if you're not going through it, as I said, there's a number of people around you now and everywhere you go that are. And uh, what they don't need is you to freak out about them, but they need you to be an encourager, a supporter, someone who prays for them, who is there to be a friend, a good friend for them. And so this is from me. In the last few years, I have committed myself to paying and working on and developing in my physical health. I pay for a coach to tell me what to do, how to do it, how to recover, here's what's hurting, how do I fix that, here's my performance, and sometimes he goes, that performance sucks, and then other times he celebrates. The other day he sent me a big celebration emoji, I was so happy, I felt like I made him proud. Uh, in, in one of the areas of my performance, he tells me what to do. Uh, and, but this year I've committed to my family that I also want to add some tools into my tool belt in, with my mental health. And growing in this capacity, not that I have the biggest struggle in this area, I've, I've had times where I, didn't, I wasn't at optimum, uh, but this is an area that I go, when I run into this, I don't want to be ill-equipped. When I run into this in other people's lives, I don't want to sit back and just go, I just do burpees and then it fixes me. I, don't, I want to be able to offer something and put more tools in the tool belt. So this is, that's me, I've, I've decided, I've made that commitment, I want to grow in this area because both of those things to me are far too important to neglect. And when I look through the Bible, they, they hit both of those really strongly. Spiritually, mentally, physically, these are things that God talks to very clearly about saying, make sure you look after these areas of your life. And so I've committed to going, I'm going to up the ante in this. Uh, and so there's permission if you needed permission. But from my perspective as well, I believe that the problem 
society has and is currently experiencing is, is not at all completely solvable apart from God. I think 100% we need to do the things that we can do, but then, only, like, then believe in the things that only God can do, that He's the only one who can heal and redeem, renew and transform us, our heart and our soul, that He's the one that can take something that is old and rebirth it, create it brand new in His image. And this is where I think the world will find itself in a bit of trouble when we're trying to deal with things that have a spiritual root in a non-spiritual way. That this is where God is. And here is the truth. The good news in all of this is no matter where you are, God wants you free. No matter what you've experienced in the past, God wants you free of it. No matter where you find yourself right now, God wants you free and more free than you've ever experienced before. I run into so many people in a whole different areas of life that take up this stance of, well, this is my lot given to me in life. I will just have to go through this for the rest of my life and I'll probably have to deal with it now. In the last couple of years, I've sat in a number of doctor's appointments with family members where the doctors say, hey, this probably won't kill you, but you will die with it. You're going to have to deal with this for the rest of your life. And we just sit there and go, what a load of rubbish that I'm not going to accept that when I've heard from my God, my Father, who says, no, I'm going to give freedom from these things that you're going to decide to live with, is that God wants us free. So please, don't be someone who accepts going, oh, well, I've been told that this is going to be my burden for the rest of my life when God is saying, hey, come to me and I'll give you freedom. Come to me and I'll give you peace. Come to me and I'll take the things that are old and bring them to be new. After Easter, if anything, we should understand that there is resurrection power in the name of Jesus. That those things that were dead or dying or not optimal, he wants to breathe new life in and see come back into life. That is who our God is. He's still in the business of resurrections. So let's not be people who go, no, no, that's only in a spiritual sense, but come on, let's have the faith to say anything in my life that is not in the will of God, anything that is on earth that is not like here on heaven, we should understand, hey, we've been taught to pray on earth like it is in heaven. If I'm not going to deal with this while I'm in heaven, I'm gonna believe that I can overcome it here and now. That God wants us free. I can't believe this idea that I will d deal with these things for the rest. I might, but I'm told to have faith to overcome it. I might have to deal with, I will, I will go through a number of things my whole life, but I'm told, we are told to have faith to overcome, to experience freedom. And if you look through Scripture over and over again, it's His desire for us to be overcomers. Galatians 5 verse 1, it says that it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Doesn't mean that we won't struggle with things, but it does mean that what happens to me is not my identity, that my feelings is not who I am, that my pain is not my identity, my past doesn't define who I'm becoming. Come on, and I just wanna encourage you that you are not who, what you feel. You're not what you feel. This is why we keep turning back to God saying, Lord, this is how I feel. And we try to get the, the update of him going, that's fine, this is who I've made you as. This is how I feel, but that I know that I'm not defining myself. God, you are going to define me. You already have defined me. Thank you, Jesus, right? Because otherwise, the definition I would give myself, the identity that I've created for myself, man, it, is not, it would not be fun to carry. Anyone else? Come on, I've got to keep turning back to God and saying, really, is this who you made me as? And he constantly says, no, 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 I've made you as an overcomer. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You are a son of mine. You are the apple of my eye. You are my child, an heir to the throne. Thank goodness that we get our identity from our father and not from my feelings. Because my feelings are all over the place. And this is why I always say, if your feelings were a person, you wouldn't be friends with them. Because they're all over the place, aren't they? They're up, they're down. And roller coasters can be fun, but not when you're stuck on one. That is the definition of a nightmare, I think. But often we jump on our feeling roller coaster and we stay checked on, 
riding it up and down, believing our feelings in every situation. But at some point, come on, as believers, we've got to say, this is how I'm feeling, but I'm going to step off for a second because my God is telling me that this is who I am. The Bible is full of people who dealt with suffering and pain and depression. Jeremiah, who was a significant prophet in the Old Testament, dealt with it uh, a fair bit. In fact, he wrote a book called Lamentations, which means a passionate expression of grief and sorrow. That made the Bible. <laughs> That's a title. For all of us who go, no, no, the, we, we as believers should never deal with anything bad, and that if we are suffering through it, just pretend that you're not because no one else is. No, no, one of the main heavy hitters in the Old Testament wrote a book called Complaining, <laughs> Lamentations, dealing with it, expressing it. And this is what he says in chapter three. He says, I have been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. I've forgotten all the good stuff in my life. He said, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering. In other words, he's saying, I'm forgetting all the good stuff and I'm just focusing on the things that are going badly for me. The bitterness and the gall. I, re I well remember them and my soul is downcast with me. So even if you go to the New Testament, one of the superheroes of the faith, Paul, and when you look through Paul's life, you'd go, yeah, you had a few rough days. I'd probably feel a bit down as well. But this is what he said about his struggles in 2 Corinthians one, he says, we think you ought to know. As a Paul doing what I'm saying, he's like, let's stop pretending for a second that everything is going well. I think you ought to know. So dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we went through in the province of Asia, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. We thought that we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. In the NIV version, it says that we were despaired of life itself. In other words, we expected this to finish us. We expected the, the persecution physically, and the pressure that we were feeling, we were expecting it to die, anticipated this to be the end. And I said, you might have never felt this to that kind of point, but someone near you and someone probably related to you has. And we feel this to different degrees constantly. I'm showing you here this, these things because I want you to understand that God is not silent on this matter, nor are the people of God all throughout history silent on this. And I could stop there because it makes my point well, but I just love the next verses so much. In verses nine and 10, this is the way he keeps, Paul keeps writing. He says, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead. In other words, if this did kill us, our God could resurrect us anyway if he's not finished with me. He said, and he did resurrect rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again we have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us what great faith to turn that around that Paul didn't say man everything was bad end of story he said I'm not going to lie I'm not going to smile and say oh I'm amazing everything's great how's your day going he goes no no things are tough and we expected to die, we thought this might be the end, but what we learnt is that I can rely on God in any times. I know that he can resurrect us, he can make a bad thing good, he can use everything for the better of those who love and serve him, and he can work all things out. This is Paul's revelation here, what an amazing revelation is that but God in this story. And so really quickly, I'm just gonna look at a couple of things that we can identify that, that we do that step us into the cave in ways that the Bible talks about getting us out. As I said, next week, Nick is gonna to look at a few more things from, from a much more professional manner. I'm not gonna to touch those kinds of areas um, because I, I really know, I'm a big supporter of finding professionals to help us in the areas that they are experts in and not pretending to be experts. I, my strength is what God's saying. My strength is in the Bible. My strength is in these areas. And I wanna encourage you from that uh, but next week we'll hear it differently and maybe, maybe if you need to talk to someone more specifically about things that are going on in your life, I would encourage you to find the right people, not the nearest people. Anyway. The first thing I find that leads us into the cave is life imbalances. I'm gonna go through a number over, over, this, uh, over this month, but the first one is life imbalances. Johan Hari, in a book called Lost Connections, uh, the subtitle is Why We Find Ourselves in Depression. He says this, he said, we need to stop talking 
as much about chemical imbalances. He doesn't say we need to stop it at all, but just as much. And more about the imbalances in the way we live. In fact, he goes on, I've read a number of other books that are pointing more and more data suggesting it's the way that our lifestyle exists right now is a big reason that we run into our, our fears, our anxieties, and even into the point of depression, the pace that we run in, the, the busyness that we hold, the kind of stationary life that is sitting in one spot for extended amounts of time, the food, the constant things that we are putting ourselves in is causing these kinds of imbalances. Now, 1 Corinthians 19, this is where Elijah responds to this whisper when God says, what are you doing here? One of his responses was this, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but, he's not saying that's a bad thing, but he says, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me. See, I am the only one, I am the zealous one. All the pressure is on me, Elijah's saying, which wasn't true. God had actually had another 100 prophets in, in the mountains. And he says, I had 7,000 people who were faithful to me who haven't gone away. See, Elijah here is saying, I was the only one busting my backside for you and I pushed hard and all the pressure was on me. This was perfectly imbalanced. And Elijah's saying, this, and I'm going to fail now. This imbalance of pressure, this imbalance of effort. See, what I find is that although things are doable, they're often not sustainable. And not everything that is doable is sustainable. In, in Ephesians, it actually says that it, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And we've kind of created a pace that we cannot sustain, and often it just catches up to us, doesn't it? Here's a moment we find that this pressure and this pace caught up to Elijah. And this is why the Bible goes on and on and on about things like Sabbath, about rest, about what happens when we strive in our own effort versus when we are living in the grace of God. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6, says, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. You go, one hand, <laughs> but I have two. And we live in a society that if one is good, two should be better, Yeah. Yeah, one dollar is good, two is better, one house, two is, come on. Matthew 11, this is in a, the message paraphrase, Eugene Peterson, which is a great, great pastor of our generation, he, he worded it in this way. He said, are you tired or worn out, burned out on religion? He says, come to me, which is Jesus. Get away with me and you'll recover life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Notice there that it didn't stop at just get away, go on a holiday, go have a Jesus retreat, and he's going to just kind of like tell you you're pretty and that, that's the end of the story. But no, no, the idea isn't to escape with Jesus and become a lazy Christian. The idea is to go to Jesus and him teach us how to move forward. See, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. See, not burdenless and empty and lazy, but you'll continue to live, just it will be free and light because Jesus wants us to be free. The second thing I just wanna to touch real quickly on is that we find in Elijah and I find in nearly every person in existence and especially in me, is we are great at comparing ourselves to others, aren't we? So Elijah says here in the first chunk that we read out, he says, I am no better than my ancestors. Who gives a rip? Why is Elijah bringing this up? What kind of point is Elijah trying to make? I'm no better than the people who you were living here a long time ago. He's, he's assessing himself on the benchmark of others from what he had as his social media tool, which were plenty of stories and hype and his imagination. Now, we don't have to have as much imagination to do this now, we just open our phone and find out the better dinner that everyone's eating and the car that they're driving, the holidays that they're on, and the lifestyle that they are portraying. And we, we kind of assess our backstage pass on someone else's highlight reel. And we compare really, really good here. We don't need to kind of use our imagination, we see it. And the thing here is that comparison is the thief of joy. I think Teddy Roosevelt said it a long time ago. 
Comparison is the thief of joy. And the more we desire to live up to the standard that someone else is setting, uh, setting, the more we'll be robbed of living the life that God created us to live. To Galatians 6, he says this, Paul goes, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride, which is a godly pride, not arrogance, in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Don't be carrying someone else's. Don't be assessing yourself based on the calling of, of another person. Don't be assessing your small group based on what someone else's group looks like or your business on what theirs or your family because of those people over there or your success or your worth or any of those things. Come on, that's, that's why we turn back to God and saying, come on, what have you graced me for? It doesn't matter whether my success line looks different to what other people's do. I want to be successful in God's eyes. That's why I keep saying, I don't wanna climb these ladders to find out one day that I put the ladder against the wrong wall. I don't wanna be standing before God one day answering based on someone else's purpose because he's going to ask me about mine and what he had called me to do. And Elijah here is starting to assess, saying, God, if, if you're gonna ask me compared to them, I'm gonna fail. But that wasn't the thing. I know lots of, a lot of things get bad reputation here. Technology, socials, they're not, the, the, they're not helping. But they aren't the key problem. The root problem is within us and the way that leads us to use it. But one thing I found myself saying more and more lately is if you keep hitting your thumb with a hammer, put the hammer down. And so if you keep struggling with FOMO and comparison and all these things because of social media, delete the app. Just take a break from it. If you, if you kept hurting yourself with the same tool, you'd throw the tool through the window. Well, I would. Maybe we need to do that a bit more with our phones because I believe we need to take intentional steps towards thinking and having the mind of Christ. Real quick, Philippians 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely or admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Not about other things. Think about these kinds of things. And my prayer for us, church, is, is that we might not belittle the things that impact our minds and what Christ is going to do within us. See, Romans 12 tells us that it's by changing the way that we think that, that we'll be transformed into a new creation. Changing the way we think, he says, and then once we've changed the way we think, then we will be able to see what God's will for us is good, perfect, and pleasing. So let's not belittle these things that we might be struggling with, our thought process, the lies that we buy into, the fears that we have, but let's look at it and intentionally move towards going, how should I be thinking in line with Jesus? Because my hope for each one of us is that we would experience the freedom that Jesus offers. It's freedom in every area of our life, that good, perfect and pleasing will that freedom that fits just for us, no matter our past or current situation, that we would move closer to what He has for us and to do through us. Let me pray for you, church. Father, I thank You that You did not leave us alone, nor will You ever. That You offer freedom, You offer healing. Lord, then so many of these things are found in what I believe You only, that what You can do in a human heart, Lord, is greater than what what we can do. Father, help us with the courage to, to put the, the work in that you're calling us to do in our hands. Lord, but turn to you that we might, might find something that we, no one can offer us. Lord, that renewing, Lord, that refining, that you take what the enemy has meant for evil, but you turn it to good. Lord, that resurrection power that's only in you. So no matter what we've been through or where we find ourselves in, Lord, let's look to you with all of our hope. Lord, let's take steps, help us take these steps towards you that, that we can experience your will for our life, which is good, perfect, and pleasing. Thank you. Now, as every eye is closed and head is bowed, maybe you've never asked God into your life before. You've never said yes to following Him. And you might feel that I, I need a work. I need something done within me that, that only God could do. I wanna give you that opportunity this morning to respond saying, God, I want to experience this unforced rhythms of grace. I wanna experience your freedom. I wanna to move towards your ways to see what life that you have for me within and through me as well. So that's you this morning. 
that you want to say, God, I want to know you, come into my life. Well, no one's looking around. Would you just raise your hand in the air so I could, I'm going to pray for you in a moment? I'm not going to call you out the front or do anything like that, but I'd just love to pray for you. And the church will as well. Awesome. Is there anyone else this morning? Fantastic. Let me pray for you, church. Father, I thank you, Lord. As people are saying yes to you, that, that you'd move within them, that you make them brand new. Lord, help them understand you more on this journey and that you reveal more about who they are, that they experience freedom, that they know their purpose, that they can outwork it and make a difference in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.